Jehovah set them free. Some think of these as fables with no relevance today. But God's past power never passed away. The great
said those words I'll not speak no more in his name and by the time he got through that same verse he was he was saying those words he said I, I can't quit there's a the word of God is a fire burning inside of me and he he took his towel back as Teague used to preach I want my towel back uh, he took his towel back and went back in the ring and started to fight again and uh, fought against the forces that were calling the children of Israel to false gods. I appreciate you coming and being here this morning. Ephesians chapter 5. Find your place in Ephesians chapter 5. And we're doing a series on the home, the marriage, as these banners say, our family, and our church. And we'll be talking about every part of the home, the husband and the wife, the children. And the outline for your home, the plan for your home, is laid out in God's Word in Ephesians chapter 5. Other places as well, we'll look at several of them throughout this series but we discovered in Ephesians chapter 5 uh, verse 18 and following that the way that we're to have a godly home a home that is a model of what the Bible teaches is number one everybody in the home ought to be filled with the Holy Ghost saved and filled with the Holy Ghost and then everybody in the home should be filled with praise which brings joy to our heart and then the Bible says in verse uh, there in verse 20, we should be filled with thanks. If we're filled with thanks, it's hard to argue with somebody that's filled with the Holy Ghost, filled with joy, and filled with thanks. It's hard to have a conflict and an argument with someone like that. If everybody, mom and dad and all the kids, act this way and are filled with these things, and in the last verse that we should be filled with submission, submitting ourselves one to another, allowing ourselves to give ourselves to one another 
for the happiness of the home, the happiness of the marriage, and the happiness that we enjoy in serving Christ down here. It is not gimmickly. It is not trivial. God's advice is not superficial and it's not manipulative. It is the way God plans on taking a home and putting it together and allowing in this sin-cursed world for men and women to know what it's like to have a godly home. Before we can get to verse 25, before we can get down to chapter 6 and verse 1 and talk about the children, before we can get to chapter 6 and verse 2 and talk about the parents, we have to lay down some foundational things for relationships. So we started in that last sermon and we gave you those those four things, be filled with the Holy Spirit, be filled with praise, be filled with thanksgiving, be filled with submission in your heart toward those that are in your home. It will make your home a better place. Where you have been filled with the Holy Spirit, which means you're under control of the Holy Spirit. And obedience to the Word of God. And obedience to the Word of God, there's an overflowing joy that comes out of that. It comes out in our songs. It comes out in our thanks and praise for what we have. Instead of taking what we have for granted, we enjoy what we have, knowing that it's come from the Lord. and allows ourselves to be submitted to the happiness, success, and blessing of marriage and of family. There was a book that came out several years ago called The Pillars That Support a Fulfilling Marriage. These were the pillars that he had wrote. He said security, communication, romance, touch, intimacy of spirit and that the wife should find herself getting in touch and cultivating the right side of her husband's brain I don't know the right side of my own brain how is she going to get on the right side and cultivate the right side of my brain men are simple in nature women can can be hold it can be complicated in nature When we say, what's for dinner, do you know what we're asking? What's for dinner? Like, you could use one menu item there to to answer that question. Chicken, spaghetti, steak, that's all we want to know. But you know what we get back? Well, I was thinking about having spaghetti this evening, but I realized I didn't have enough hamburger in the freezer. So I went to the grocery store, and when I got to the grocery store, they were having a sale on pork chops. And when I saw they were having a sale on pork chops, I saw this beef roast, and that beef roast looked better than any beef roast I've seen all year. So I bought that beef roast. So there, there's 30 minutes for us to find out what I simply wanted to know, and that is, what are we eating for dinner? (laughs) That's good, Amy, but that's not what I ask. What are we eating for dinner? And eventually we get to it, and we realize that men and women are created differently, and that book said the best way that you can bond as a family is go camping. That's what it said. Number one, my wife does not camp. She does not like bugs, snakes, the outdoors, trees, dirt, rivers. She don't like any of that. That's not any way of us getting it. That's a good way for us to get a divorce right there is me to take her camping. Yeah. So we have, we have this impractical knowledge of marriage and books that have been written and Christian books, and I'm sure that they, they are well-meaning books, but the pillars of marriage are not communication and intimacy of spirit. Instead, the, the keys to marriage, the pillars of marriage are written down in Ephesians. If we'll be filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with praise, filled with thanksgiving, and filled with submission toward one another, we will find ourselves in a place where we can, where marriage, we can live out our Christianity. And if your life is right, you can be productive and fulfilled and blessed every day. If you do not, Christian or lost, if you do not, then marriage is fraught with pain, disappointment, unfulfillment, sadness, anger, and the rest. And then all the children are brought up in that unfulfilled, unhappy place. That's not what a home should be. In fact, the Bible goes so far, Paul writes to Timothy that the pastor of the church should be one that ruleth his own house well, having his children in subjection with all gravity, For if a man know know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? It says that the pastor or the elder, that he should be an example of one that is committed to the care of his character, his home's character, his wife's character, his children's character. Because if he can't do that, how can he tell you how to lead your home when his home is in disarray? 
And I have my wife here as an example, and my children, one's sick and one's working. When they are here, they're able to testify, I am not a perfect dad. I am not a perfect husband. Don't say amen right there, Amy. I am not perfect, but I have tried my best to live a Christ-like example in front of them at home. And God wants to grow those seeds of good things in your home. And instead of your home being a place of conflict, many times the word marriage is synonymous with the word conflict. Instead of your home being a place of conflict and fighting and disagreement and anger and separation, your home can be a place where God steps in and lets you see uh, the garden experience again. In fact, I suppose that when it comes to the, the term marriage, many times what we think of are men that are oppressive, husbands that are insensitive, daddies that are chauvinistic and abusive and uncaring. Not all are like that, but all men are under the curse. Turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 3. I'll show, this, I'll show you where this conflict in marriage come from, and it may help you to see that some of what's wrong in your marriages is because of the curse. And the only way that you can correct it is you have to, through Christ, get out from under that curse and out from under the sin that is in us and live and dwell in such a way that the Holy Spirit takes over and takes control. Where the husband seems to be that way, women in society can be overbearing, nagging, backbiters, not wanting to submit to their husbands. And it's all... In Genesis chapter 3, not all women are that way, but all women live under the curse. Look at what it says in Genesis chapter 3. And the Lord God said unto woman, in verse 13 through 19, And the Lord God said unto woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. She was deceived. Eve didn't know for sure what to do, and she was deceived by the serpent. So the Bible says in verse 14, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed, which is Satan, and her seed, which is Jesus. It shall bruise thy head, thy head, Jesus, shall bruise his head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Just a, just a slight wound. When Jesus, just the cross, was a slight wound. It did not take any of his power. It did not take any of his strength. But he said, one day that seed is coming to crush your head. Under the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. And sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. And thy desire shall be unto thy husbands. And he shall rule over thee. In these verses, we find that there's the curse of the serpent. There's the curse of the woman. And there's the curse of man. There's a curse that brought conflict and chaos into this marriage. That at one time there was no conflict. Everything was equal. Everything was the same. Man and woman had been created by God. But sin and the curse caused separation between God and man. Separation between man and nature. The next verse says that when it came to Adam, he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife and hast eaten of the tree, I will command and say, uh, I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat. Of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shalt bring forth unto thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field, and the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, and for dust thou art, and dust thou shalt return. Adam had it made. He didn't have to go to the grocery store, he didn't have to plant a garden. He did not have to grow and prune trees. That garden was producing for him all the fruit and the food that he needed. All he had to do is walk by and pluck an apple off the tree or a pear off the tree or an orange off the tree or whatever fruit God had put in there. And now God said, you're cursed, Adam, and you're going to have to work to provide for your wife and for your children. Not only that, the curse, men is the leadership and the authority of the home. The curse is you and us being under the burden of leadership. And I know you men have felt this. When I first got out of high school and began into college, I began to feel the pressure and the burden of being a man. 
needing to make my own way, pay my own rent, buy my own food. And then after I got married, I began to feel that pressure. God, can I do what my dad did? Are we going to be able to afford cars? And are we going to be able, am I going to be able to feed her? Am I going to be able to take care of her? Am I going to be able to love her? And the pressure of that leadership was on us. And you, know, you men know that you feel that. I want to be successful. I want my children to have better than I had. And there's pressure every day under that leadership to make wise and right decisions. Do you realize that pressure and anxiety and that burden of carrying that one day when we're outside of the curse you'll feel that no more you'll have that on you no more but now you've been cursed to be the leader of the home and in that leadership you have you have you have to provide for your home and to protect your home it's a lot easier for me to sit where you're sitting when Teague was here and I was not in leadership it was a lot easier to come in on Sunday morning and not have anything to do but to sit and worship the Lord and listen to the Word of God and say amen and shout when the choir sung. Now that I am in leadership, I have spent hours this week studying and praying over what I'm going to say this morning. I have been digging and cultivating so that I can come in as the leader of this place and feed you and give you the Word of God. And at the same time, I am the protector of this place. There are many that would like to come in and control. There are many that would like to come in and change it. But I have to, as a pastor, be a protector of this place and keep those that want to take control and take over. There are legalists that want to do it one way and liberals that want to do it one way. And in the middle, there's your pastor trying to lead. And I'm saying, men, if you're alive today and breathing, you feel the burden of that curse and that leadership over the home. We feel that burden and carry that burden, but I want you to look at the, the woman. At the height of womanhood, at the height of what she can do that nobody else can do, and that's bring life into this world. God said, at the height of what you are, I am going to put pain and travail in your childbearing. You are going to, because of the curse, you are going to have to feel physical pain. You are going to have to go through excruciating pain to bring life into this world. But then it says that she would desire her husband. That's what I want to focus on. This is not talking about desiring him physically. That certainly is not a curse. Say amen right there, men. Amen? Don't you want your wife to desire you physically? Yes. That's not the curse. That's not what that word is talking about. She had already desired Adam physically. That already existed. To desire him, and it's not talking about desiring him as protector. That has also already taken place in the garden. And that was not under the curse. In fact, it says from the very beginning she was designed to compliment him. But he was the one responsible to take care of her. And that already existed because she was, and the Bible calls her, a weaker vessel. Ladies, don't let that offend you. Please don't let that word offend you. When it comes to working in my yard, and Paul talks about the woman being the weaker vessel. And what it means simply is a more delicate vessel. Someone that you have to watch to take care of more delicately than the rough old man. Men, you know, if I go out in my yard and I'm trimming bushes or trees, I wear blue jeans. And I wear, uh, or I wear, uh, I wear Carhartt or something that's tough so it doesn't tear. I don't wear my dress pants to mow my yard in. You know why? Because they're weaker. They'll tear. They're silk or woolen. I don't wear these out in the, in the bush to hunt. And I don't walk through... I don't walk through thistles and thorns in my three-piece suit. I, don't, I wear something that can handle that. So that's all that God means by that weaker vessel, that more delicate vessel. He said that those women that uh, you and I are, are starting homes with, that the man, does it mean that the man is weaker emotionally? Oh, no. It doesn't mean that he's weaker physically? Oh, no. I know that we're physically stronger and we're wrestling with that in some of our sports. I know that we're physically stronger, but he's saying that that woman is a more delicate vessel what does it mean that she would desire him why would she now want to desire him if she didn't desire him before it has to be something other than sexual desire what is it what is that desire well we can find it in chapter 4 in chapter 4 in verse 7 this is what the Bible says for if thou doest well shalt thou not be 
accept it. If thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And under thee shall be his, what? Desire. In the story of Cain, he, de he decided that he was going to do it his own way. And the Bible says here, it is the only time this Hebrew word is used as the word desire in Genesis or, in fact, in the Pentateuch completely. It's the same word as Eve's desire. Sin's desire toward Cain, it wanted to crush him. It wanted to dominate him. It wanted to take over his mind and his actions. Sin wanted to rule over Cain. Sin wanted to force him to do certain things. Sin wanted to control him. And it's the same word that the Bible says Eve will have after the curse toward her husband. She will want to control him. She will want to dominate him. She will not like being under his authority. And remember that authority came after the curse. I think this is a parallel to what's going on when it talks about the woman having the, the desire, she should have, when the, certain the, the serpent tempted her, she should have went back to her husband. Adam, just remember this. Adam was older than her. Adam knew more than her because for a while he was alone. And when we, she, she was tempted by the serpent, what she should have done is went to her help me I want to say this when it comes to making decisions decisions in our home are all the much more better when me and Amy are deciding on things together filled with the Holy Spirit even though I'm the leader of, of my home it is so much better when we can talk it through together and make right decisions together if she had gone to Adam and said Adam this is what the serpent said Adam would have probably knocked that fruit out of her hand and said don't eat it don't eat it baby don't eat it boy what a, what a wonderful world it would be if he had done that what a different world it would be but at that moment when the curse came in conflict came into marriage the man under the burden of leadership and sometimes he becomes oppressive and a ruler the woman that is underneath his leadership now she finds herself desiring to be back where she was equal with him desiring to be back where she was now the only time that we see this is in the New Testament when Paul says in Christ there is now no more male or female we are all one and the same in Christ we are believers but we are brothers and sisters in Christ made the same now the Bible says the Bible says that when it comes to that curse that man will bear the weight of that leadership and woman will want to not to submit to that leadership because of her desire to rule him and dominate him we see this all the times too many times in marriages that have failed in the generation before us in the generation before us divorce was something that people just didn't do instead what they would do is remain married and miserable some of us saw this in our grandparents you can see it sometimes when you go out to vacation and you'll see a little couple walking there'll be a little lady walking and about 10 spaces behind there's a little man walking behind her mumbling to himself tell me what socks to wear I wear what socks I want to wear <laughs> tell me where I'm going I'll tell you what to do is what I'll do and she'll turn around she'll say what did you say I didn't say nothing just keep walking isn't that what we normally see in marriage? That is not what God wants in your home. Instead, he wants a home that is together. Man then is left with this curse as well. He seeks to dominate her. Why is there always a women's liberation movement? If it's not a movement still there in the heart of the woman, and why is there still, if there's not still a, a desire for that woman to be like man and to take over his authority? I don't have any problem with women working the same job as a man and getting paid the same. I have no problem with that. That's not the issue here. I'm saying that she naturally, because of the curse now, and that sinful beating heart, that woman wants that authority. Man, in his beating heart, wants to dominate. He wants to oversee her in a wrong way. Possibly one explanation for all the intensity, ambiguous character, that in all this time, everywhere it brings conflict. Now I want you to know, woman by her fallen nature is not willing to submit, but desires to control and exert her individualism. Adam by the fall wants to stay king of the mountain. 
Do what I say, woman. That's what I want to say, isn't it? Don't argue with me. We feel the pressure of leadership. She doesn't want to take that leadership, and it brings conflict into the home. And in the middle of that boxing ring are children listening to that kind of home, thinking, when I get married, when I get married, this just must be the way it is. Grandma and grandpa fight. Mom and dad fight. So when I get married, we're going to fight. And I want you to know there are arguments that take place. Arguments are not bad. Arguments are just working through things. Well, Amy and I argued this morning. Last week, the sink in my bathroom had broke. So I went into her bathroom and I got ready in there and I left my brush in there. And I said, uh, I think my brush is in here. She said, no, it's not. And there in the drawer laid my brush. And I said, that's my brush right there. She said, no, it's not. She said, that brush has been here for a long time. You didn't bring that in here last week. So I picked it up and I said, can I use that brush? And she said, yeah. And I picked it up and I started to walk out. And when I did, I picked that brush up. Underneath it was another brush that was the original brush that she thought I was talking about. When I picked it up, she said, I'm sorry, you were right. <laughs> Wait, let me get my phone. I want to record that. I didn't tell her she was wrong. I just picked up the brush. Listen, this is wisdom, young guys. Listen, just pick up the brush and walk off. She knows she's wrong. You know you're right. You don't need to prove it. You can be right and unhappy. So I want to talk just for a minute about the history of Paul when he's writing at the church of Ephesus. You think, well, it was different then. It was different in those days. It was different than the day that we're living in. No. The world has been sick of sin since this curse, and it's been sick ever since. I want you to know that marriages have struggled in every area of society. Let's start with the Jews. Do you remember the last time that we talked to you about the, the Jews, and Paul was writing to some Jewish people here in the early church? They had unbiblical views when it came to marriage. They had some unbiblical views when it came to men and women. One of the things that I told you last time is that the Jews thought there were five people not going to heaven. One was an unmarried man. Two was a woman without children. Do you see now why those women in the Old Testament prayed that God would send them children? This is not Bible. That is not what your Bible says. This is just something they had developed in their culture. The Jewish men every morning will pray a prayer. Listen to this prayer. It is not Bible. It's not contained in this book. In fact, it goes against this book. But this is what they pray. God, I thank you that you have not made me a Gentile, a slave, or a woman. That's what they pray. That's their attitude toward women. And that's in order. They hated Gentiles and called them dogs. They said, they're saying, I'd rather, <laughs> I would rather be a Gentile than a woman. I would rather be a slave than a woman. Women in their day and age was just an object. It had no legal rights. She had no, she had, she had no power. And her husband could do whatever he wanted to with her. In Deuteronomy chapter 24 and verse 1, it talks about the laws of divorcement. Listen to this. When a man hath taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes, because he hath found some uncleanness in her, let him write her a bill of divorcement and give it to her hand and send her out of her house. Now, what this is talking about in Deuteronomy is that if you send your wife out, once she's gone, sir, she cannot come back and marry you. So be careful about the bill of divorcement. Don't send her away if you really love her. Don't send her away just because you had a fight. That's what it's talking about in Deuteronomy chapter 24. But the Jews used those phrases to do everything, everything that they could in marriage to go against what the Word of God had established as marriage. One rabbi taught that the only uncleanness that it's talking about is adultery. Remember Jesus had this argument in the New Testament? In Matthew chapter 5, he talked about that. He said that some of you just give a bill of divorcement for any old thing. He said, but I say except for the sin of adultery. There was one rabbi that taught that. There was another rabbi that said this could mean all kind of uncleanness. You could divorce your wife if she spoils your dinner. You could divorce your wife if she spills your dinner because they spill. A spilt dinner is a spoiled dinner. You could divorce your wife if she's put too much salt on your dinner. You could divorce her if she walked in public with her head uncovered. You could divorce your wife if she talked with men in the street. I like this one. She could, you could divorce your wife if she spoke disparagingly about your mother-in-law. 
Don't talk about my mama. <laughs> he could divorce her, according to this rabbi, if she ever argued with you about anything. He interpreted the phrase of men that a husband could divorce his wife if she became unclean in his eyes. Listen to this. Because he found someone else prettier than her. Ladies, aren't you glad you don't live in that kind of society? Guess who had more followers? The rabbi that said one reason, adultery only, and the other guy that's writing out bills of divorcement left and right. What's so funny about the Jews is, is that they were so proper about getting a bill of divorcement. They wouldn't do it without a bill of divorcement. They had to go to the rabbi, get a bill of divorcement. But what they were doing to their wives were unjust. They would discard their women, and these women would be victims of other men and then that's why prostitution was so rampant among the Jews because these women had no other way to make money no other way to feed their children the Greeks also were as worse if not worse than the Jews because the Greeks had no had no scripture that they were following they were following all kind of perverted philosophies of men the Greeks had a familiar uh, a similar approach to marriage and when it came to marriage they just blatantly disregarded marriage fidelity altogether prostitution was rampant among the Greeks in fact they found themselves time and time again they would use prostitutes in the temple and the only way that you could commune with the God is to get completely drunken and have sex with a prostitute and they said that you could commune with that God and you can imagine what that would do to your society if that was the way that you worshiped and how it would destroy the home time and time again. In fact, there was one Greek writer, and this is what he said, we have courtesans for the sake of pleasure. We have concubines for the sake of daily cohabitation. We have wives for the purpose of having children legitimately and having a faithful caretaker to our household. They basically said to the women, you have the babies, take care of the bills, and the men went out on their own and found their friends and sex outside of the home this is the way it was in most Greek Greek homes there was no legal procedure for divorce if you didn't like her you just kicked her out or you just left her all together divorce was rampant prostitution was rampant harlotry harlotry was rampant all sexual kinds of sin were rampant in the Greek culture now let's get to Rome Rome was worse Paul is writing this to these folks in this age and this is what they had to deal with in their homes in that time. Seneca wrote and says that women were married to be divorced and divorced to be married. Jerome said and tells of one woman that they had the records that she had been married. Uh, when she got married to her husband, it was her 23rd marriage and he is 21st marriage. Emperor Augustus was so wicked, he demanded that one man would divorce his wife so the emperor could be with his pregnant wife. Jerome said, and he writes, that women avoided having children for losing the fear of their looks. Doesn't that sound familiar? Many of the women that are abortionists say that they don't want to have those children because they don't want to lose their youthful looks. It's the same society we're in today. Same thing going on today. Paul's writing in that society, we're suffering the same ills of today. And this is what God says, there is a way. I have a plan for you to marry one man and you to marry one woman and to stay happy forever and in that home raise children and they're happy forever. And it's, it's, it's anchored in the word of God and what God says in his word. The Bible says when it comes to the Roman women, they had begun to build up their bodies to compete with men in acts of physical strength. Does that not sound like today? The transgenders trying to get in each other's sports. The feminism was so rampant in Rome that they tried themselves to take over men's positions. Again, this is the cursed working itself out. Feminism. Paul used the phrase without natural affection. I don't want to have children. They'll destroy my body. I don't want to be under a husband. I don't want to be under his, his, uh, I don't want to submit to him. And I don't want to have children. They're just going to get in the way of my career. They didn't want to be dominated. And this is what the Bible says. In the last times will come on perilous times. And women, men will be without natural affection. 
They wanted to defiantly charge into areas where men, only men, could go. And what I'm saying about this feminism is that it is rampant in our society and it has grown in our society to the place where we have got the roles and the plan of the home all scrambled up. And God said, that is not how I started it in Genesis, and that is not how I want my people, Christians, to live here and now. Unhappy marriages were innumerable in Rome, and divorce was epidemic. Marriage literally became a, perform, a form of prolonged prostitution. Is the kind of background, basically, of the fallen human race at its height. There was infidelity, there was incest, divorce was rampant. Of course, you know the Romans fell into homosexuality. Many of the Caesars slept with young boys and young girls. Pedophilia, adultery, prostitution. That is the very same thing that we're experiencing in our society today. And God is telling the Christian, there is a better way. There is something greater than what you're doing and the sin that you're involved in. And his way is written down in Ephesians chapter 5 and in this book, all over this book. If you have time, turn in your Bibles to Psalms, uh, the Song of Solomon. Right after Proverbs, there's Ecclesiastes, and then there's this little book of the Song of Solomon. This is, and I know, how, I know what time it is, this is the perfect marriage written down in this little book, the Song of Solomon. A husband who steps out and loves his wife in such a way that he decides, I want to provide for her so she has no wants, and I want to protect her so she knows that I love her and care for her. And a woman who comes under that protection and that provision and says, he is my man. He, he is, uh, she comes out singing in the morning, what a man, what a man, what a mighty, mighty. That's what it is in the Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 3. Look at what she says about him. As the apple tree among the trees of wood, so is my beloved among the sons. I sat down under his shadow with great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. Oh, what poetic, sweet poetic language. As she says, he is, a, he is an apple tree protecting me from the sun. He protects me, and then he provides for me food to eat. Verse Chapter 2 and verse 4, it says, he brought me to his banqueting house. His banner over me was what? Domination? No. Overseeing? No. Authority? No. His banner over me was love. Stag me with flagons. Comfort me with apples. For I am sick of love. She's love sick. It's so dewy sweet what she's saying. It just drips off the cards that she writes to him. She's in love. His left hand is under my head. His right hand doth embrace me. I want him to hold me, she says. She's talking about physically. I want him to hold me. I love him. I care about him. Verse 7, it says, I charge you, old daughters of Jerusalem, by the rose, by the hind's feet, that you stir not up or wake my love till he pleases. She said, I want to make sure that he's taken care of. He's made sure that I'm taken care of. I want to make sure that he's taken care of. These are, these are two people that are married and are committed and submitted to one another fully to make sure both are happy. This is what he's talking about in Ephesians chapter 5 when he says, submitting yourselves one to another. The voice of my beloved, verse 8, behold, he cometh leaping upon the mountains and upon the hills. He's athletic. Ain't nobody can beat him. He's the greatest that there is. My beloved is like a roe, a young heart. Behold, he standeth behind our wall. He looketh forth the windows, showing himself through the lattice. Like a deer, as it hides behind the bushes in the trees of the wood, she's watching him because she loves him. She's bragging on who he is, his strengths. She says, My beloved spake and said unto me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away, for lo, the winter is past. The rain is, is over and gone. You say, preacher, this must be a young couple. They must be on their honeymoon. No. She said, the winter is past. We have been in this marriage for quite some time now. The rainy season, the rain is over and gone. Look at what it says. For the flowers appear upon the earth, and the time of singing birds has come, and the 
The voice of the turtle is heard in our land. The fig put it forth her figs. It's already harvest time, speaking of the year. We are late in this marriage now, but she's still in love with him, and he's still providing and protecting her, and he is still in love with her. Arise, verse 13, Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away, O oh, my dove, that, that art in the cleft of the rocks and the secret places of the stairs. Let me see thy countenance. Let, there, let me hear thy voice, for sweet is thy voice, and thy countenance is comely. You kind of get the idea that this girl's in love with him. She said in verse 15, Take us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vine, and our vines have tender grapes. My beloved is mine, and I am his. He feedeth among the lilies. That's the key to the whole thing. I know that I am the only one he desires, and I know that he is the only one that I desire. Isn't that, a, isn't that a great way to have a marriage? To know that he desires no other person and she desires no other person, but their desire is for one another in that they're wanting to make each other happy? My friend, there's no conflict here. They do conflict. They do have conflict in chapter 5 and verse 2. Something has happened in their little marriage, their little, their little uh, romance, their little courtship. And in chapter 5, let me flip over there. At the, at the end of the chapter, she is made up with him, and she starts talking about, about him. Verse 10, chapter 5 and verse 10, My beloved is white and ruddy chief among the 10,000. She said, he's better than 10,000 men to me. I love him. They've made up after this fight. His head is like, his head is as the most fine gold. His locks are bushy as a black raven. His eyes are as doves. Uh, the doves of the rivers of water, washed in milk and fitly set. His cheeks are a bed of spices as sweet as flowers. His lips are like lilies dropping with sweet, sweet myrrh. His hands are as gold rings with a barrel. His belly, listen to this, his belly is as a bright ivory overlaid with sapphire. His belly, he's got a six-pack. What this woman is saying here, basically, to bring it up to date in, in modern language, she was looking at him saying, hubba, hubba, hubba. Have you ever seen, in all of your travels, a man and a woman come through the airport or come through the mall or come through a place, and she is just drop-dead gorgeous, and he looks like a toad? <laughs> Have you ever seen that? Do you wonder how he got her? He won her heart by expressing his love deeply for her. In chapter 5 and verse 2, in the beginning of the chapter, we find them in a fight, and he's standing outside in the rain. And standing outside in the rain, she, he finally uh, knocks on the door. She won't let him in. She's mad at him. He leaves, and then when she finds out that he's left, she starts calling out to the watchman. She said, please help me. Help me find him. He's gone. The daughters of Jerusalem, I cannot find him. Can I, would you help me find him? And then when she finds him, she says these words. She says, oh, I found him, and I'll never let him go. I want you to know when it comes to marriage, that's the kind of marriage you can have from the day that you marry until the day that death comes. You can have that kind of marriage where you are, you are completely in love with one another, with conflicts, with fights, with arguments, but you realize that both are filled with the Holy Ghost, both are filled with praise, both are filled with thanksgiving, and both are submitted to the happiness of the other. This is what Paul says, and I'll close with this. This is what Paul says, and we can go all the way through the Song of Solomon because she she and him keep, keep going, talking about how much they love one another. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3, it says, But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ. The head of every woman is the man. And the head of Christ is the church. Submitting yourselves, therefore, one to another. As a leader of this church, I am submitted to you. I don't get to do what I want to do. I get to do... My life's work, but I am submitted to you. I have to be your servant. I have to come in prepared, preach. I have to come in and, and give up some of my family time to sit down with your family and help you in, in, in marital counseling or in family counseling. I have to give up some of my days to go preach. Last week I was away from my home 
uh, all week, slept in a different bed down at the hotel. I don't enjoy those hotel beds. Those hotel rooms are never fun for me. There's always noise. Somebody making noise. There's always, yeah, I don't sleep good in those hotel rooms. I'm just saying, when it comes to leadership, many people think that leadership is someone that gets to do what they want to do. No, you become a servant to all those that are there. When you're a husband and you're the leader of the home, you're the head of the woman, you become a servant to her and those children that you submit, that you make sure that their needs are taken care of and that they're happy. This is what Paul said. Know this. Christ is the head of the church. And all of us are submitted to Christ. And if I am submitted to Christ, then I will submit myself to what he tells me to do as a husband in his word. Ladies, if you are submitted to Christ, then you will submit to what the word of God tells you to do as a wife. And children, if you are submitted to God and saved, you will submit yourselves to what the Bible tells you to do as a child. We'll get to that. That's one of the easiest things. All you've got to do is obey. But the key to it is that we're all submitted because Christ was submitted. The Bible tells us that God is the head of Christ. But God and Jesus are equal. They are the same. They are, they are two parts of one God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. This is what Christ did. Is he submitted to the will of the Father that he may be your Savior. And now that you serve Christ, you submit to Christ. He submits to the Lord. Everybody's submitting to one another. Do you see that? That's how God wants your home to be. A happy home. An enjoyable home. A caring home. When we are all filled with the Spirit, when we're all filled with praise, when we're all filled with thanksgiving, and when we're all filled with submission. Is that your home? Is there a battle raging? Are you dominating everything as a man, trying to cause people to submit? As a woman, have you become overbearing, nagging, trying to get him to do what you want him to do? As a child, have you become disobedient, thinking that your parents don't know? Your parents know. Just remember as a child, they've been your age. You've never been their age. They do know some things. Would you stand to your feet with your heads bowed and your eyes closed?